Welcome everyone, it's the uh, end of the first day, so I thought let's have a bit of fun and let's be a bit stupid. Uh, so I want to start this talk with a bit of a disclaimer. The following talk contains examples of bad code and poorly thought out ideas. Do not use this on a production system. The speaker is a trained professional. I want to start with a bit of a story. This is me in 2013. I was getting married. Uh, just to be clear, getting married was not the stupid idea. Uh, <laughs> my wife saw me working on the slides and she's like, why are you giving a talk called Stupid Ideas and putting a photo from our wedding in there? So just to be clear, getting married was not the stupid idea. But we did what, we, what most people do after they get married, is we went on a honeymoon. We went up to a little rainforest retreat on the border of New South Wales and Queensland. Um, and I did what any good nerd would do. I took my laptop. I can probably end this story right there, because you're probably like, yeah, okay. That was probably not the best idea um, that you had right there. Like you, you're like a week into your marriage and you've already gone, hey, well, I'm just going to keep bringing my tech with me. Um, <laughs> but like, we're, we're going to be somewhere with like, no phones, no Wi-Fi, uh, all that, like, those radio signals that Dylan was talking about in the keynote. You know, none of those were going to reach where we were. Um, so it was a good chance for a bit of downtime. And, and, um, and the reason that I, you know, I took that is because there was a JavaScript library that was out that was getting a, a bit of traction. Um, you might have heard of it, AngularJS. So AngularJS, not Angular. Um, and as someone that was spending a lot of time doing front-end web development, there was a really interesting part to it that no other approach to modern web development uh, that I'd come across had, and that was built-in dependency injection. Now, my, my background was building server-side applications as a C-sharp developer, so I was very familiar with the concept of dependency injection, but the whole idea of it in JavaScript, I, I, like, I'd never thought that you could do that. You know, I'd, never, I'd never seen that done in any kind of library, and it really fascinated me as a problem. Because you know, when we look at the way that it works, you know, we have a controller here, and inside of that controller, the function, the, the function definition for that controller, we provide $scope and $local. Um, and these things were then part of our dependency injection like, uh, framework. They, they, they were dependencies that were getting injected here. And having being familiar with the way dependency injection works on the server, I know it works off a type system. Well, JavaScript's type system is nowhere near advanced enough for us to have dependency injection. So I was just fascinated by the fact that this worked. And obviously, ignoring the other ways that you could um, define the, the dependencies, I was just really fascinated by the fact that this code ran and knew what dollar scope were and what dollar local would be, sorry, locale would be. Um, but also how it could continue to understand that when you know, we ran through a minifier, and these are now called A and B. This problem had been bugging me for months. I'd been looking at it going, you know, how does it actually work? And you know, I now had a bit of downtime. I, was, you know, I wasn't going to have the distractions of, of Facebook and Twitter. I, I was just me and my wife and um, a whole lot of nothing to do. So one afternoon while she was asleep on the couch, this is my opportunity. Sneakily grab the laptop out of the bag, go to the other end of the couch so I don't disturb her, uh, and just started playing around, like trying to think through how that problem would work. I came across that, that function has a two string on its prototype, unsurprisingly, all, um, all things in JavaScript do, and most programming languages I'm familiar with have a two string on that. And when we execute a two string on a function, we get that function as it was passed by the JavaScript runtime, unsurprisingly, as a string. And then I had a light bulb moment. What if I applied a regex to that that looked for where the function keyword was, maybe a bit of white space, maybe not a bit of white space, and then some open and close parentheses. And anything open and close parentheses, those are our dependencies. I can then extract them out, again, run a bit of additional code over the top of them, and all of a sudden I've got the names of all those arguments that are being passed in. I can compare them to my RSU container, and it should all just work, right? So I decided to write a thing. Uh, inspired by my favorite um, .NET IOC container, uh, Autofac, I created a thing called Autofac.js, which was intended to be a general purpose IOC container for JavaScript. So, why? 
Okay. This is, uh, I'd been doing front end for about five years at this point and I had never needed a general purpose o IOC container. In fact, had anyone needed a general purpose IOC container for JavaScript? I, I didn't know anyone that had. I'm pretty sure if I went to my colleagues and said, hey, you know what this project needs? IOC. And they'd probably look at me and go, yeah, you're an idiot. <laughs> that's, a, that's a stupid idea. But what I learned by doing this was how you actually make something like that work. Like, how do I then pass those arguments into the function if I don't necessarily have the direct reference to that function? I, I, I only have, um, I can only call against it. So I, I got to explore more about how things like bind, apply, and call work with inside of JavaScript. And this made me really think slightly differently about how we can use JavaScript, and particularly starting to think about it in a more functional programming mindset which then means that when I'm talking to other developers about how to use JavaScript, people that maybe haven't done a lot of JavaScript or um, maybe they have a bit more of a, a functional programming understanding but don't really uh, know how to apply that in the web, uh, I, I've got some, some other things to explain to them or, or, or why arguments in JavaScript work the way that they do and how we can do things like function currying and all that kind of cool stuff that allows us to um, create new functions from existing functions in JavaScript. Um, the other thing I probably learned by doing this exercise is writing code on your honeymoon is not the best idea. <laughs> Luckily, my wife's pretty understanding, uh, so I got away with it. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to why. And that's kind of the crux of this talk. I want to talk about why do we do stupid ideas, or why do we want to encourage people to make stupid things with software? I skipped over the introduction, so at work, uh, I'm in sales, so uh, I'll give you 30 seconds to exit the room if you would like. Uh, I work for Redify, uh, I've been with Redify for eight years, and for seven years I worked inside of the consulting team. This is me as a consultant for Redify, total hacker. Uh, but I've worked at a whole range of different companies. I've worked in some of the large banks in Australia, I've worked for small startup companies, and through this I've seen a whole bunch of different team cultures and different ways that people are motivated to do the work that they're doing with inside of uh, their, their organization. And there's one fundamental thing that I find consistent across every kind of business is that we want to encourage a culture of learning. You know, whether, it's, uh, whether or not we're trying to work out how to type the word cat into a computer, or we're trying to work out how to build something that our customers consume, you know, that's all about creating a culture of learning and encouraging people to do that. So throughout this talk, I want to uh, explore a few more of my stupid ideas, what I've learned for them, and hopefully encourage you to be comfortable to, uh, to take on some stupid ideas as well. So the next idea is abusing Git. Uh, this one was something that, it kind of came out of a, a bit more of a need um, a, a number of years ago when it was really clear that Git was going to be the source control that was winning the wars that were you know, between it and Mercurial. Uh, it had obviously beaten out things like TFEC and SVN and CVS and um, SourceSafe for anyone old enough to have remembered some of those. Uh, but what we were seeing is that more and more of our customers for Red from Redify's perspective were looking at how they could transition to Git. Uh, Microsoft was getting really involved in Git and obviously we've seen that progress through to the acquisition of GitHub. So it was now enterprise ready, which meant that you know, big companies were like, oh, it's enterprise, I can use Git. Uh, but that was meaning that I, I was spending a lot more time training people that had probably come from a traditional source control um, system, so a centralized um, source control background, to uh, trying to work with something that was distributed. And that's a very different mindset. And I wanted to be able to explain how Git would work to people that had no concept of how Git worked, it worked or um, we're, we're very stuck in the mindset of a traditional um, centralized source control system. So I really wanted to understand a bit more about what Git was doing internally because by doing that, I'd be able to do more of a, a relationship of the Git concepts to what they might be familiar with, whether it was SVN or, um, or, or TFVC or anything like that. I, I, I'd be able to relate it back to something that they understood so it didn't feel quite as foreign a concept to them. I also wanted to be more confident that if we got into a state where things were broken, that, the, that we didn't have just the solution of, I'm gonna copy out the files that I think I've changed, and then I'm going to delete my repository from my disk and go, okay, well, let's just clone again. That's an easy solution. 
in my younger days, I spent a bit of time playing chess. I was never particularly good at playing chess, but I like it from a, a problem-solving uh, mechanism. I, it, there, there's a, a lot of things I find very interesting about the way you know, the, um, the pieces can line up and, and the outcomes you can get by putting pieces in a particular order. I'm just pretty terrible at playing chess, as my father-in-law will attest to. Um, he beats me pretty consistently. In fact, I don't think I've ever beaten him. But I digress. Uh, and, and thinking about how, like, thinking about what chess looks like is that every move that we make on a chessboard, you know, that's a point in time. That represents uh, I, uh, one of the possible moves that we could have ever had, but it represents a piece of state. We can't change what that move resulted in, you know, and that's kind of what a git commit is. We can't really change what happens when we build a git commit. You know, like, sure, I'm not, like, we can rewrite git history and all that kind of stuff, but you know, fundamentally, what we've got is you know, a thing that doesn't change. And then every potential move after that, well, that's kind of a branch from where we were and how we got to that, con that point. And there's obviously a lot of potential moves that we've got, depending on the number of pieces you've got left on the board. So if we could represent a commit as a point in time, and then we could create branches that represent all the next steps from that, well, we're starting, like, this kind of sounds like what we could do in, uh, in a Git repository. And also, the position of the pieces on the board, there's a lot of ways that we could get there. So the fundamental piece of, of Git, a blob, well, there's a lot of ways we could get that. So we should be able to reuse that blob in multiple different locations, in multiple different commits, and multiple different branches. And if we could create an, a blob that represents every single po uh, position of chess pieces on the board, um, and then we could create commits that link them all up to each other, we could create branches that represent every possible outcome of a game of chess and essentially model that, and then create something that can walk that from a, uh, a play that's been made and work out, well, what's the next position that I could go to, and what are the outcomes if I, if I make that move? You know, this, is, this is kind of what a, uh, a chess AI has, uh, it does. It, it tries to work out what are the next potential moves based off of the, the current state of the board. So I, I, I had this idea, and I'd sat down with a couple of them and talked it through, and it seems like a great idea in theory. Um, so I did a bit more research into how you could actually implement this and it, how many potential permutations of the game of chess are there. Uh, and, and there's a couple of theories on that. Something between the order of 10 to the 40 and 10 to the 50 number of potential outcomes in the game of chess. Th th those are, those are kind of kind of big numbers. Uh, but there's, there's uh, another school of thought that is uh, the number of potential outcomes in the game of chess is greater than the number of atoms in the observable universe. We're probably going to need a bigger hard drive to model this. <laughs> I actually sat down with a friend of mine that works at GitHub and explained this to him, and he just looked at me and he's like, wow, that is one of the stupidest ideas I've ever heard. So I decided to go a little bit more simplistic than this. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I need to be constrained by the number of atoms in the observable universe, what's a, what's a slightly more simplistic game? Tic-tac-toe. We have a three by three grid, only nine, um, uh, nine squares on that, so it's probably a little bit easier to model and we're not gonna have quite as many um, uh, move placements that we could have. So, how does it work? I, I decided to actually try and implement this. And I wanted to do it without normal git commits because I wanted to understand what's happening when we run the git commands that we have. So, we start off with git hash object. So the command hash object takes uh, an input. Either uh, we read it from a file. In this case, I've created a file on disk called game.txt, and inside of that, we just have nine by nine white uh, space characters, and that represents, uh, sorry, three by three white space characters, and that represents our board. We haven't played a move yet. Uh, I could actually read this from um, standard in. Uh, that's the other way that we can consume something into uh, get, uh, the hash object command in git. It doesn't have to be already on disk. Uh, I'm passing in the dash w flag to hash object because I want to write this as a git object. So what that does is it creates me a new blob into the git index, and we'll store that in our dot git folder slash objects with the SHA that I'm not going to bother reading out, but the first two characters of that SHA, in this case 27, become the folder inside of the git objects folder, and then everything after that is the name of the file. And I'd always wondered what the contents of that folder was and why the logic was the way that it was. You know, like, what do those two numbers represent? And that turns out what it was. So, 
I've got something in the blob. Uh, I've got a blob created, but it's not attached to anything. It's, you know, so what do we do next? Well, the next thing we need to do is we need to update the index to know about this blob. So we use an update index command on git, where you pass it some arguments. We're going to add a blob, or we, more accurately, we're going to add a SHA, which represents a blob, to the index. We're going to provide it with some file system attributes. Uh, and this is a Unix file system um, uh, attribute. I think that's just for read, write. Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, what they properly represent, but that's what cache info is. It's file system attributes. We then give it the SHA of the blob that we're wanting to add to the git index, and then we give it the name of, or more accurately, the path to where that blob object is going to live with inside of our git repository. You'll notice that I've given it tic-tac-toe.txt, whereas previously it was called game.txt. That's what it was on the, on the disk. Well, it's because we're adding this to Git. Like, we're not caring about what's on the file system. Git doesn't care what's on your file system. It's what's inside of itself. And then realizing that actually, hang on a sec, we're, we're starting to build um, stuff that's got file system attributes to it. Well, it's because Git is essentially a Linux file, or a Unix file system. Well, it's a, it's a derivative of a Unix file system. And that was kind of like, wow, like mind blown that that was the way that it represented its stuff. So once we've done our, um, our hash object and update index, that's essentially the same as doing git uh, add and then passing in the name of the file that we want to add. And the thing is that this time I'm not saying this is the name of the file, I'm actually overwriting that name with um, the tic-tac-toe.txt. All right, so we've got our stage set up. Now we need to write a tree. So this is the path with inside of our git index that that file is going to live at. So I'm just saying write tree at the, at, uh, of the current stage into the git index or the git file system, uh, which is going to live at slash because I'm not giving it an additional folder. Uh, so this tree object, then we could have multiple tree objects, then that's how we create folders. And if uh, a tree object's parent is a tree object, then that's, you know, that's starting to build out a folder structure. And then finally, whoops, wrong button, we run the git commit tree command, which commits that tree to the git index, uh, sorry, to, to git itself, not just in the stage. Uh, we provide it with a git uh, commit message, dash m. We're probably all familiar with that one. Uh, we give it the uh, char of the tree that we created uh, the, from that um, uh, previous slide. And that gives us a new char, in this case, 41A, A55, et cetera, et cetera. Congratulations, you have created a single commit that doesn't have a parent or anything else with inside of a git repository. We could now use that SHA for the result of commit tree to pass to another commit tree command, uh, presuming that we've done the three previous steps as well. And we will then create a commit with a parent, the parent being 41AA55, et cetera. We then maybe create a different commit with that same parent. Now you've created a branch because you've got two commits with the same parent. Is it particularly useful? Probably not. Artisan handcrafted Git repositories, like we used to make back in the day, are really not that functional. You know, uh, <laughs> I actually only went to about two moves in the game <laughs> state because it was just like, there's a reason that we have high level commands like add, commit, et cetera, because you know, they're pretty tedious to work with just raw on the file system. But it means that I understand, I, I, I never understood what's the whole point of that, you know, all this different stuff that's inside of the Git folder. I know it's there, I know it's important, I know if I delete things, things get really broken. Uh, but understanding what Git is doing as I'm running through each of these steps meant that when I was sitting down with someone having a conversation and, and they're, they're wondering, well, in TFVC, I just create a folder in there and then I can add a file to that folder at a later point. But when I do a, a, a clone of that um, repository on disk, I get that folder. That's cool, but Git doesn't understand the concept of folders. Like folders don't, like they, they don't exist because a Unix file system doesn't really understand the concept of folders. They're just trees with children in them, and unless those children, uh, unless those trees have children, the tree doesn't really exist. So, given that we know the building blocks, we can then look at what you know what our high-level tools are doing. You know whether it's using like, the the GitHub um, for Windows or something like that, or whether it's Git extensions. Kraken or any of those higher level tools, we know that you know, if we get into a state where things are broken, what's it done underneath? You know, like, where are things happening? Why, what's the difference between a stage versus a commit? You know, why does that happen? Uh, and ma it makes it easier for us, uh, I, f I find it makes it easier to have conversations with people. You know, 
<laughs> we don't really need to hand roll Git repositories all that often, but you can still do it if you try. So how do we motivate people to, to want to do something like this? You know, like to go out there and you know, create a handcrafted Git repository with commits that you would you know, normally have done with high level commands and not executed four things and have to copy and paste shard values around because <laughs> that's kind of tedious. We really want to make sure that our staff that are working with us, our colleagues, our, um, our managers, you know, th they're happy in the jobs that they're doing and, being, and feeling like that what, what we're building as a team is something that is going to be valuable to other people. This is how we traditionally motivated people, wasn't it? You give people more money. The more money you've got, the better work you're going to do, right? That's the carrot and the stick fa uh, fallacy. You have a, uh, the carrot being the thing that you want, or the thing that the donkey wants in this case. You, the more money that you, you give someone, the more likely they're going to want to work for you, the, more, the, the, the better their product, productivity is going to be, and the more output you're going to get from them. And that's correct, right? That, like, that's, that's how management has traditionally thought. But what research is actually telling us is that people generally, they, they generally want to do a good job. They don't, they don't necessarily need money. Or to put it another way, a sufficiently large carrot can be used as a stick. Okay. We, if, if you've got enough, if you're trying to pay someone enough money, you can beat them to do what you want them to do because you're saying, well, I'm giving you a bonus. You're going to achieve what you want to achieve because that money is the only way that I can motivate you to do it. And this is why things like KPIs and performance metrics on, um, on staff are just not that effective, at least. That's what the research is now telling us. So how do we encourage a culture of learning? It really comes down to having trust in our employees. Now, maybe not the trust that Hank Scorpio is demonstrating here with Homer, but if we give people room to experiment, if we ensure that people don't feel like they're getting looked down upon because they've had some kind of a failure in their experiment, they're going to be willing to try. Anyone that's got small children or has had small children and they're now slightly bigger will know that kids, will, kids are great at experimenting. They'll always try something and they'll try it a hundred times to work out what did and didn't work. And you know, they might do the same thing and get the same outcome and you know, wait, why do I keep falling down and getting a sore knee? Well, eventually they'll, they'll work out that maybe if I don't fall on my knees, then it's, uh, I'm not going to have that problem. But if you encourage them to you know, keep trying, to keep trying to jump over that, uh, that rock in the backyard, they're, they're likely to not, uh, they're, they're going to not see failure as a bad thing. So how do we give people room to grow and room to learn and kind of really motivate them down that path? Google has um, historically had their 20% time, and that was always their, their kind of big motivator. Uh, jury's kind of out whether or not the 20% time is really 20% of what they do or 20% on top of your day job, uh, and that's how we motivate, motivate people with inside of Google. But the idea is that if you give people a time that they can experiment, things can come out of it. That's where products like Gmail were born. Gmail was actually just in like an internal Skunk Works project that someone did in their 20% time. Uh, and I think it's done pretty well for itself, don't you reckon? Uh, Atlassian has always had their ship it days. It's, a, it's like a 24-hour hackathon where people are encouraged to do something that they think will benefit the company. Uh, I've had chats with Atlassian people about this and you know, what kind of things do people do during internal hackathons. And someone once told me that a, a team went around and replaced all the light globes on the floor with low energy light globes because they saw that was a way that they could benefit the company. Benefiting the company and benefiting, benefiting everyone else isn't just what more cool code can you write? What else can we deliver in a product? But it's, it's thinking bigger than that. And you know, giving someone the space in the room that they, they feel like they can do that is, is, I think, a really positive thing. At Redify, we have uh, professional development time, or PD time. And this is where people are encouraged to attend events such as this. That's why I'm here, is, um, is Redify has encouraged me to do this. Um, or it could be that you want to uh, attend a workshop, study for an exam, um, or just pick up a piece of tech that you've been interested in playing with. You know, maybe it, you, you've been wanting to work out how do chatbots work. So you take a, a, a week off, um, which is a, a paid time from, uh, from the company, to sit there and just build something with, 
with a chatbot you know, for Alexa or for um, you know, the the bot framework and, uh, on Microsoft and just work out how does that work because it's going to make you f uh, give you a bit of enjoyment because it's something you, a problem that you've wanted to be uh, solving. Uh, it's not forcing you to try and spend a whole bunch of time outside of hours to grow as a as a developer or grow as a as a person. So that's kind of really what it, it comes down to is if you if you give people either time, money, or some other form of encouragement um, to, to take out to money as in go and buy you know, tools that they need, that, uh, that really fosters this kind of culture inside of a business of, um, of, of learning and trying to achieve something different. So back to my stupid ideas and the, the kinds of dumb things that I like to do. Uh, I had an idea that I wanted to do something that uh, tackle a really simple task. And what if I said, Let's write our own number system in C Sharp or JavaScript or you know, pick your language. Let's write our own number system. Do you look at me and say, you, you know computers kind of like they know how to do numbers well, right? Like, it's, it's a pretty well solved problem. Do you just like go, okay, yeah, <laughs> cool. You do you and walk off. Um, do you point out that that's a really stupid idea uh, and that maybe your time's better invested trying to solve something else? I, we all know that 2 plus 2 kind of equals 5, like for extremely large values of 2. So we know how numbers work, right? Right? Like we all went to school, right? We, 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 at least I was pretty confident I knew how numbers worked. So it can't be that hard to create your own implementation of integer values. Um, let's let's ex ignore floating points and decimals and doubles and stuff like that. Let's just start with integers simply. Um, it, it can't really be that hard. Um, I was actually inspired by going to a talk uh, where someone gave a talk about how to use, uh, how to implement surreal numbers. Um, so uh, I'm going to apologize to any mathematicians or anyone from a, a mathematics background in the audience because I'm going to completely butcher the description of what surreal numbers are um, because I'm not. A mathematician, or I, I, I really didn't get very far in uh, in university mathematics. But the idea of surreal numbers is that it's working on set theory. So we have sets that represent uh, represent numbers. So this is a, a representation of zero, uh, and this is how I'm representing it inside of C sharp. It's a multi-dimensional array. So I'm going to say that this is what zero looks like. It's an array with two. Em uh, it's an array with two empty arrays. Uh, I'm going to call them the left and the right piece. Seems a good logical name to them. Uh, one, I'm going to represent by having a set on the left of it. And then two is going to be a set on the left that contains a set. And that's how we start implementing it. Um, I'm then going to create negative values, which is going to be on the right. So negative one is a empty set on the right-hand side. And then negative two would be you know, Two empty sets, so, so an empty set containing an empty set on the right-hand side, so on and so forth. And we can basically build this up, and, and that's how we can represent pretty much any integer value, right? You know, kind of, is that, it's, it, it's just that simple. Numbers aren't hard. Maths, yeah. Oh, this, this is a slide deck I designed for an American audience. Math, because it's a singular, not a plural. I, and I don't even understand why it's that in, English, uh, in Australian English. Um, but as I started building this out, I came to the realization that equality tests are really just knots of all the other equality tests. So something that is so one number being greater than a number just means that it's not less than or equal to it. For a number to be equal to another number, it means that it's both greater than and equal to and less than and equal to at the same time. You know, less than and equal to is obviously a number that's not greater than. Less than is a number that's not greater than or equal to. Boom! Like, like, for, like for, for me and someone that was never particularly good at math and never got really into it, I, that was a massive light bulb moment for me. I didn't realize that it was actually that basic the way that um, the way that equality tests work in in numbers. Um, and then I realized that when I'm creating my own number system, I have to probably implement at least some elementary arithmetic, you know, the basic operators that we can do: add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Add is the process of taking all the values from the smallest number and putting them on the larger number one at a time until the smallest number has no more numbers left to give. So it's back to zero. Subtraction is just the reverse of that. Take it away from the largest number, the number of times that there are a smaller, uh, in the smaller value. Uh, multiplication is just recursive addition. Division is recursive subtraction. 
power of is recursive multiplication, which is recursive division, which uh, fundamentally is just moving one from one side to the other. Rooting is just recursive division, which is recursive subtraction, which is recursive moving one from the biggest to the smallest. And I kind of, oh, hey, there's Windows saying, um, do you want to do an auto update? No, let's wait an hour for that. Because uh, that would be a really bad time to do it. Uh, and, and what I found by going through this exercise and, and breaking down the way numbers work is that I, I know at some point I'm going to have to teach my children how to do elementary arithmetic. And I've actually been doing this experiment with my three-year-old son at the moment. Is I, I, I show him, I'm like, oh, hold up your hand where you've got one and one. Like you've got one finger on this hand and one finger on this hand. And if I go, I have two. I've taken one from this hand, put it on this hand. And if I go the other way, I've just subtracted one. And look, he doesn't really get the whole addition subtraction thing yet. But but he's like he he will sit there and and he'll just go. <laughs> and then he'll be like, mummy, mummy, mummy. <laughs> so he's starting. Uh, so I. I don't know how else I could have easily explained the way that you do one plus one to a two and a half year old. That's when I started, um, started explaining it to him. But I know that at some point in my life, I was going to have to do that. If you're interested, this is actually how you do a less than equality test. So the, the fun thing about the fact that all equality tests are just like knots of the other equality tests is eventually you're going to have to actually implement one of them, or otherwise you just end up in a loop. <laughs> um, so. I've got um, me and uh, called me and them, which is the, the left hand side and the right hand side of the um, the operator that we're using for the test. Um, if the left hand side is a negative number or zero, and the right hand side is a positive number or zero, then we'll return true because if the left hand side is negative and the right hand side is positive, it's going to be less than. If the left hand side is negative, uh, sorry, is zero and the right hand side is positive, it's going to be less than. If they're both zero, it's less than or equal to. Wow, like <laughs> it's pretty simple when you when you break it down like that. Um, then uh, the the inverse to get false if uh, if left hand side is positive and the other side is negative and or they or neither of them is zero, um, or if the, if they're both positive numbers, which of them is the smallest? So we basically just race to see who gets to zero first. So while they're both not zero, we're going to take a value off each of them minus one. And we keep going, keep going until one of them hits zero, our loop breaks, and then we just return was the left-hand side zero. If they, were, if they got to zero at the same time, then they were equal. Um, and then if they're negative numbers, we're just going to increment them. And whichever one gets to zero first was the bigger number. Sorry, was the smaller number. And this is where we get a lovely golf clap of congratulations. You've worked out the computers are really efficient with doing numbers. That code is not particularly efficient. Computers, on the other hand, like, numbers are a solved problem. I probably didn't need to do this. But it was a really interesting thought experiment. And uh, I, I learned a lot more about how to explain something to someone that you know, hasn't spent 30 odd years working with computers and working with a number system. But the other cool thing is, I am no longer constrained by your primitive notions of, ma of max value. In dot max value, in 64 dot max value, ah, they're, they're useless. I mean, the only thing I'm actually constrained by is CPU time and memory. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I did actually, so I have actually implemented this um, because why not? Uh, and then I decided to see what would happen if I did int plus max value plus int dot max value. Seven hours later, I decided to kill the application. <laughs> I don't actually know what number I got to. Uh, turns out that, yeah, not particularly efficient. So why do we do this kind of stuff? Like, why do we why do we explore these stupid ideas? Is it because our goal out there, like, we're we're really altruistic and we're trying to make people happy and you know, we're we're solving problems that our end users are going to solve, or are we doing things just because it's fun? It turns out that when we're trying to motivate motivate people, there's a a form of motivation called intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is around give, uh, people have a desire to solve a problem that's put in front of them, and we want really. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do: is we're trying to encourage people to solve problems, you know, even if they don't necessarily need to be solved. Because once we've learned some kind of a solution, you know, we, we we wanted to solve a problem that didn't need to be solved, we then get an opportunity to share our experience. 
I, I'm up here talking about just some really stupid things, but the, obviously the other presenters at the conference are talking about things that are probably going to be a lot more useful in your day-to-day -day job. You, know, you might be able to uh, you know, learn how to use something like Mediator to um, uh, in the application you're building or using something with inside of Azure or machine learning with uh, My Little Pony. But we also get the satisfaction of saying, why not? Why don't we try to solve these problems that really don't need to be solved? Continue, uh, back to, back to my, the stories of my stupidity. I want to talk a bit about Link and open source software. Back in 2008, I was working for a company in Melbourne uh, that had started working with an open source uh, content management system called Umbraco. Also, what was interesting in 2008 was that was when we saw the release of .NET 3.5, and that was the first time that Link was introduced to the .NET language, or sorry, the, um, the, the .NET framework, and was available in, in C Sharp. And I found Link to be a really fascinating sort of thing. Like it, it really, I saw it as a real massive change in the way that we could communicate with databases. It linked to SQL. Um, for, for all of its flaws as an ORM, I think it was really powerful in getting people to create a lightweight um, ORM and, and do really basic CRUD operations, moving away from you know, either a custom rolled code generator that you might have had, and that's what we were using at the company that I was at, or whether it was um, just, you, know, you were just doing raw ADO.NET, calling store procedures, and converting them into like table adapters uh, and data sets. So I had this idea that uh, I was working with Embraco, and I was like, oh, I want to write my own link provider. I, I didn't know what problem I wanted to solve yet, but I wanted to try and solve a problem with link because it, I just I could see the power that it was. And at the time, Embraco was very heavily based on XSLT as the way that you programmed against it. This was uh, the you know, noughties, the, the late noughties. Is that the way that we describe that part of the 2000s? Um, and every content management system was XML, uh, was XML based in terms of the way it structured content, and it was XSLT based in the way that you interacted with content. Now, they had a .NET API, but the .NET API was pretty crap. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to create a link provider to replace the .NET API because link is awesome. It will solve all of the problems that we could ever have in .NET programming. I don't care what you have to say. But this was 2008 in the Microsoft ecosystem and open source. That was a very different time to where we are now in terms of open source with Microsoft. Um, they, so I had to work out how do we contact the core dev team. And we didn't have GitHub, we didn't have Slack or Gitter or anything like that. How do, how do you get in contact with these people that um, I think originally they were hosting their own SVN server and then they eventually moved it to CodePlex. So I ended up using Twitter to just find the, um, find the people on Twitter that were the core contributors and just started harassing them going, hey, um, I've got this cool idea, you know, what, what, would it need, what would it take for me to try and get this into the open source project? Uh, so I was pitching my idea to them, and I'd build a little proof of concept about how this could work. And they went, sounds kind of cool, actually. They invited me to come to their conference in Denmark. And I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Uh, I've never attended a conference at this point in my life. Uh, I've never been to Denmark. Uh, I've only been out of the country like twice. Um, but sure. They also said, well, why don't you come to this week that we've got, uh, this weekend we've got beforehand, where we're getting all the core contributors together, uh, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll talk about the stuff that we're going to do with Embraco. I'm like, um, I haven't actually contributed anything at this point in time. Um, I, I don't quite know how this open source stuff works. But yeah, sure, why not? Like, you know, how hard could it be to, to work that stuff out? Uh, so it was time to get coding. Like, I, I'd given myself a hard deadline, and there is nothing like giving yourself a deadline to actually try and like, deliver something. Yeah. Not saying that a death march is the only way to deliver software, but it, you know, at least in open source, it can uh, have some value. That's going to come back to bite me in the ass at some point in time. <laughs> uh, the, the .NET framework wasn't open source. Um, so <laughs> I had to work out how Link worked. So it's time to crack out .NET Reflector. Who remembers that one as a, uh, as a tool of choice? Uh, I was so sad when it became a commercial product. So grab that, grab the .NET, core, uh, .NET frameworks, throw, throw them in there, and just start like, clicking around, working, like, try and work out what the hell that it does. Um, well, like, what the heck is this expression tree thing that it keeps generating? I don't know why. It, it's, uh, it kind of sounds like an AST. Um, I mean, I remember the like the terminology of AST from my comm side days, but I don't actually know how it works. 
um, I kind of like muddled my way through and got it to a point where I'm like, oh wait, you mean I have to like decompose method calls? If someone's done like equal with uh, a quality test with uh, like the equal um, uh, operators, or they've done a quality test with dot equal, like that's different. Really, and I have to handle those in different cases. Um, the original version of Link that was shipped in .NET 3.5, um, if you did dot .select, or if you just had like dot .where, and then you um, assigned them to variables, that resulted in two different expression trees, despite the fact that they were, uh, so if you did like dot .where dot .select, or if you did just dot .where and assign them, they, those were two different expression trees, and you had to handle them separately, because select resulted in an additional bunch of stuff happening in, uh, even if it was, had a no up in there, it still resulted in something different. I'm like, oh, I'm, this is hard. Uh, I also set myself the challenge of building some Visual Studio extensibility around it. I really like the way that Link to SQL works, so I kind of wanted that for, for Embraco. Um, the Visual Studio extensibility in 2008 was just not documented. Um, you're really working with a COM API, and I would left COM behind with like classic ASP when I first started my career, and I was a .NET guy. I did not need to deal with COM. But somehow I managed to get something that was kind of working shipped just in time to, to go to this conference. And I've, so I've jumped on a plane, I've flown for like 30 hours to get to Denmark, rolled off, it's six in the morning, the sun is at about a midday sun for Australia, I'm like, what am I even doing here? Uh, but it resulted in a, like, it drastically changed the way that I was, uh, uh, the, the way that my, my career was going and the, the out comes that um, would have followed over the next couple of years because it gave me the first chance to speak at a conference. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd looked at people that were speaking at conferences, I'd, I'd watched talks online, I'd never imagined that I was going to be someone that would be at a conference talking about something that I love to do or something that I'd built. Um, and I then got invited back a couple of times um, following that to, to speak about stuff that we were doing with Embraco and like, that was, it was cool. I, I, I never thought that just this crazy idea of, you know, I could totally write a link provider with zero documentation, I'd actually get that opportunity. Um, I, I was offered a job in Sydney at, at a company, um, which for my current employer was probably a less desirable outcome for them. Um, but more importantly, it gave me a start in open source development. Uh, uh, again, open source in 2008 was a very different world in the Microsoft ecosystem, and I never thought that you know, uh, back then that I could have been a contributor to something that was used by tens of thousands of people at the time, or uh, uh, Broca is now used by hundreds of thousands of developers all over the world. I never thought that I could be involved in that sort of a movement. And I was like, I, looking back on that time, I'm, I'm so thankful for the fact that I, I had the opportunity and my, and my employer was really willing to support me, um, kind of to their detriment, because I came back and resigned, but they still were really willing to support me to be involved in this project, to, to get it. Um, <laughs> I actually had a, had a beer with the um, CTO of the company last weekend when I was in Melbourne. Um, uh, he was the CTO at the time, and he harbors no ill feelings towards me, thankfully. Uh, it is nearly a decade later, so it's water under the bridge now. <laughs> but just taking that leave, having an employer that was encouraging me to, to try something different, to do something that wasn't you know, necessarily going to solve problems that they had for their customer. It really, it felt so much more empowering than if I had to spend all my weekends and weeknights sitting on the couch trying to build this on my own. Who has played with DNS? Or who, who's heard of DNS? Cool, okay, no, it's a rhetorical question. I don't actually think people needed to put their hand up for that one, sorry. Um, but I had a really bad idea around DNS. Uh, one of my colleagues, Jeff Huntley, uh, presented about a Raspberry Pi project called Pihole recently, uh, just on an internal se uh, session. Uh, if you're not familiar with Pihole, it's, it's basically an ad trap. So you put it on your network, you use that as your DNS, and anything that is going out there and making a request to an ad service, uh, they have a, a couple hundred thousand um, blacklisted domains. Any of those domains that get requested get sent to essentially a void um, IP response, and there go all your network, uh, there go all the ads. Uh, interesting enough, I was talking to another person about this recently and they reckon about 70% of their home network traffic is now discarded because of Pi-hole. 70% of their home network traffic is going to ad services or things that you don't want to be, uh, to, to tracking, uh, like to block you from tracking. Now sure, you, you still ad block in browsers, but as at a DNS level, if we can block that, we can block it on mobile devices, we can block it on, um, I, I think Jeff said he was blocking it on his IPTV. 
because it's just going through all the like the, the local DNS on, on your home network. Kind of cool. And like every good developer, I've got a Raspberry Pi at home, and it's sitting in a drawer, so I totally can use it. And this is a picture of my Raspberry Pi. It is literally somewhere in my house. I do not know where it is, and it is not responding to ping. <laughs> but I also have some of these. This is a Node MCU. Uh, I have a bunch of these that I picked up at a conference, and they're these tiny little microprocessors. And I'm like, well, I might not have a Raspberry Pi, but I do have this. So let's build our own DNS proxy server, because I've got, I, I, I can't use uh, Pi-hole for it, I, but I can totally build my own. Well, here's the first problem. I have no idea how DNS works. Like, I've just always taken it for granted. You know, it's like, like Dylan was talking in his keynote about radio waves. Like, they just work. I've just, but I've never thought about it. Problem number two when writing your own DNS server, or at least targeting a, a node MCU, is this thing has four meg of memory. That's not a lot. Like, I can't NPM install onto that thing. <laughs> Not without like chaining up a huge cluster of them, because I only have, I've got a, I'm really memory constrained in what I can run. So I need to be able to run a DNS proxy as well as host like, run a whole bunch of blacklisted IP address uh, domain name, sorry, because that's like that's the stuff I want to discard. Okay, sounding a little bit harder. Problem number three. The tooling for a Node MCU is really basic. Like you know, this thing has no memory. Um, I don't think you really measure CPU cycles on something that big. It does have 16 input and output pins, so I can connect up lights and I can make them flash, and then I go, that's IoT done. Uh, the, so I've got no debugger. Um, the best I can get is console.log statements that write back over the USB that I've, uh, cable that I've got connected and write into this console of uh, a hosted Chrome application, uh, and it breaks half the time, so that's, that's not really looking prom promising. Maybe I can just build one on Windows. Uh, well, wait, how do I run a custom DNS server on Windows? Um, okay, this is, this is starting to become a little bit more challenging, but damn it, I've had this idea and I have to work out how to solve it. Despite the fact that we know how DNS works and it's pretty well documented and there's plenty of implementations out there. So um, uh, I've got Docker and I've got F Sharp. Because why build one DNS server when you can build two? Uh, I also wanted something that um, I, I'm more familiar with strongly typed languages, and I much prefer developing strongly typed languages if I don't really understand the thing that I'm trying to build, because you know, there's it, it, a lot to be said about the value of you know, hitting a breakpoint and uh, or, or at least having that type safety when um, when you're dealing with you know, binaries that are getting uh, binary streams that are getting passed around, um, and by putting it in Docker. I don't have to worry about the fact that I can't bind to port 33 on UDP and Windows. Did you know DNS runs on port 33 in UDP? <laughs> I didn't. Not until like two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, I just the DNS just works. So I can totally debug this because I can debug in a Docker container, and you know it, this is it, it's easy, right? Now, now the only problem is to read the DNS spec. Um, work out how that works, work out how to parse the binary stream that's coming in from the DNS socket, so the, the UDP socket, um, pull that apart, work out what the URL that you're trying to request is, or you know, all the different kinds of requests that could go over UDP, uh, sorry, over DNS. I didn't know there was multiple kinds of requests that could go over DNS. Again, like, this is stuff that I, I, should, I either should have already known or I should never have had to know. Um, and this is actually what it looks like. Uh, I've got a tiny little DNS proxy sitting on the, the top, and if I, um, I, I have another Docker container that's using it as its DNS server, and I run a ping, and you can see those are the, um, the domains, well, you probably can't actually read them, but those are all the, the hops that it's doing to work out you know, this response back saying that's the IP address that the NDC Sydney website is running on. Now all I have to do is cra uh, craft a response that takes a bunch of blacklisted DNS uh, records and gives them a void response. And then I need to write that in JavaScript that can run in four meg of memory, because this is a Docker container that's like 200 meg because it's using um, the ASP.NET Core SDK. But those, like, that's like problems for the future. Uh, I actually have, have not even gone further than writing this, because I was like, yay, I managed to make a DNS proxy, and then something else shiny happened. <laughs> so in closing, when you have your next idea, are you just going to glue the pieces together or are you going to try 
something different. I really like this, um, the, this point that, that uh, was made in the keynote, that you know, a lot of what we build is just gluing together problems that other people have previously solved without kind of understanding what's happening under the hood. You know, sure, we're not going to go out there and build our own radio towers to then build you know, a cellular network on top of that, then you know, all the stuff that sits above that just so we can send, <coughs> send a cat picture to someone. But at least I, I found that keynote really exciting because I have a better understanding of the stuff that I never needed to know. Don't be Millhouse. Don't think that something is a stupid idea and just not want to follow through with it. Or if someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got an idea about building X. Do you want to, do you want to help me with it? And you just don't look at them and think that that's a stupid idea or discourage them from wanting to try something different. Because when was the last time that you tried to freak out the establishment, tried to do something different to what you might have tried to build previously? Build something that has no production value. Encourage your peers to build something that has no production value to look at a problem differently. How are they going to explain that to the next member that joins the team that has maybe never worked with React before? How are you going to explain React? Maybe try building it yourself to see what actually happens when the React uh, engine runs. Have fun, be stupid, and don't be afraid to make stupid ideas. Thank you. If you want to hear more stupid ideas, uh, PubConf is on Friday and I'll be there speaking about stupid ideas and there'll be a whole bunch of other people with stupid ideas. Um, there's still about 10 minutes left if anyone has questions. Otherwise, uh, it is the end of the day and I do, will not feel offended if you just want to bolt out that back door. <laughs>